Uh, today we have four talks set for you, a uh, wide variety of topics ranging from Red Wing uniforms to uh, some analytics to uh, Rocky Calavito. And uh, leading off today is going to be um, Jeff Klein, who's going to talk to us about his uh, They Stepped Up to the Plate program um, that he and his uh, daughter and the rest of his family, I'm sure, have been helping out too. Um, have been running the last uh, few years to uh, celebrate uh, um, the Negro Leaders. So, Jeff, you want to come up and you can uh, tell us about They Stepped Up to the Plate? Thanks, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Ryan, I got invited here today to talk to you guys about passion of mine and my family's and uh, how it started 2014 my daughter and, and I apologize ahead of time my daughter couldn't be here today she's she's at the uh, girl up summit in Henrietta uh, 2014 she was a second grader in Honeyway Falls and she came home during Black History Month and she said dad dad I've, I've, I have I want to tell you about something I learned today I have a new hero I go you have a new hero I go what happened so she explained to me that her teacher at the time talked to them about civil rights and she learned about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Ruby Bridges. So she asked me if she could write a letter to Ruby Bridges. And if you're not aware, Ruby Bridges was the first black girl to go to an all-white school in New Orleans in 1960. So I looked at Michaela and I said, honey, I, I don't know if Ruby Bridges is still alive. I go, I remember hearing about her when I was a kid. So I did some research, found out that not only she is she's still alive, she's young. She, she was born in 1955. So uh, I told <coughs> Kayla, I go, yeah, here's an address for her. And I wanted her to pursue this letter writing. So at seven years old, she sat down and she wrote a two and a half page letter to Ruby Bridges, explaining to Ruby how Ruby is her hero and the things that she did for civil rights, how they, how they still matter today. So I wanted to seize the opportunity to teach my daughter more about civil rights, but I wanted to do it through the eyes of baseball. I'm, I'm a huge fan of baseball. I'm a firm believer that baseball played a big role in the civil rights movement in the 40s and 50s. So I ran in my office and I grabbed out all my old baseball cards of guys that started in the Negro Leagues but made it to the majors. Guys like Willie Mays, Satchel Paige, Hank Aaron, Ernie Banks, Larry Doby. I showed her all these cards and she just started eating it up. So then I said, I want to show you something else. For about 10 years, I had been collecting autographs of Negro League players. And I was concentrating on some of the guys, some of the more prominent players, guys that did make um, the Hall of Fame, but did not play in the major leagues, like Buck Leonard. And um, I started showing her these autographs, and I had maybe, maybe 100 or so autographs. But up until that point, if I saw an autograph that I liked on eBay, I would just go on eBay and buy it. And you can buy these autographs anywhere from three dollars to twenty five dollars they're, they're actually relatively cheap so that's how I started building this collection of Negro League autographs so I, I was discussing civil rights and baseball more with my daughter and at seven years old she looks at me and she goes daddy why don't you write letters too and I it hadn't dawned on me to, to, to do that so I said let me do some research so I started researching and found out that depending on whose estimates you want to believe, there were about 7,000 players that played segregated baseball from 1920 up until 1962. And there's anywhere between 100 and 200 of them left alive today. So I wanted to start corresponding with these players. And it started as a way to teach my kids about civil rights and along the way collect a few autographs. But it, it morphed into so much more. And that's what I want to share with you today. I started writing letters, and at the beginning I was keeping track. Um, I was keeping track of how many letters I had written. I, had, I was keeping a spreadsheet. I had something on the internet. And I stopped counting at about 200 letters. I've now written well over 300 letters in an attempt to find any living players from the Negro Leagues. And astonishingly, we've heard back from 75 players. Once they started sending stuff back to us, and what I would do, if, if you're a memorabilia collector, you know that a lot of these guys didn't have um, baseball cards of their own made up. So a lot of them had their own cards made. But for the guys, and I don't know that going into it, when I write a letter, I don't know if they had their own baseball card or not. So what you do is you send them index cards, and they, they sign the index card. You put a little donation in there, and you, you just start getting back envelopes. So I started getting back these envelopes, and I, I received one one day from a guy named Bill McCrary. And really quick, I'll show you 
I'll pass this around so you guys can see, but if you see this pink post-it note, he put that inside inside the envelope. He signed the, the index cards that you see there, he signed those for me, he played for the Kansas City Monarchs, and he left his phone number. And on this pink post-it note, it says, give me a call sometime, I'll tell you some of the things that happened. So I came home, I was like a, I was like a little kid, or my wife came home, and she saw me, I was like a little kid at Christmas, and I said, look what was in the envelope, and I showed her. And it literally took me two weeks to build up the courage to call this guy. I didn't know what I was going to say to this guy. And um, I figured I'd get maybe five minutes of this guy's time. And the first time I called him, I was on the phone with Bill for about 45 minutes. And he played. He was on the Monarchs when Branch Rickey came to get Jackie to take him to Montreal. He, uh, he played in the Cubs minor league system. And if you ask him today who his favorite player is, he'll tell you Ernie Banks. Because when Ernie Banks left for the Cubs, Bill McCreary was able to move up into first string. Um, he got the starting position because Ernie Banks left, so that's his favorite player. But once I started talking to Bill, I realized that these guys have a story to share. And I started trying to research the guys that played through the 1950s. History tells us that Jackie Robinson went to the Dodgers in 47. And they, you'll, you'll hear the, the floodgates were opened for blacks to to go to Major League Baseball. After talking to dozens of these players, it's become apparent that the floodgates didn't open. It was a trickle. And if you look at it, if you just take Jackie Robinson's career, and you guys are all baseball fans, so you know as well as I do, a 10-year career in Major League Baseball is a long career. Jackie Robinson played for 10 years. He, he retired in 1957. And in 1957, three teams had yet to integrate. So there are three teams that had still yet to field a black player. So I started researching more, started looking for more, um, more players. We've heard back from the, uh, last, the last living umpire from the Negro Leagues, uh, Bob Motley. He actually, he sent us, and I'll, you guys are welcome to take a look at any of this stuff, but he sent us a book, and he, he signed the inside of the book for us. We've heard back from the last living owner of a Negro League, uh, League team, Minnie Forbes, and people started calling me on the phone because after Bill's letter, on the, on the bottom of my letter, I put my phone number and I just figured if someone wants to talk, they can give me a call. Well, my phone started ringing. The first guy that called me was a guy named Gilbert Black. And I got on the phone with Gilbert and he said, uh, he goes, I want to call you and talk to you about the letter you wrote. And I go, okay. He goes, uh, it, was a, it was a really nice letter. He goes, you hit a lot of the stuff that's on your mind. I go, thank you. I go, coming from you, that means a lot that you like my letter. And he goes, I just, want, I just had to ask. And then there was like a long pause. He goes, are you black? And I started laughing. And he goes, oh, it doesn't matter. He goes, I have a whole bunch of stuff that I want to send you. He goes, but I'm, I'm just curious because he said a lot, of the, a lot of the black people have kind of forgotten about this. And it's not talked about. And in fact, some of the players that we've corresponded with are gracious enough to sign autographs, but told us that they don't want to talk about their time in the neighbor leagues. And then there's other guys. Um, there was a player named Leroy Hancock we were trying to get in touch with. And every time I would write him a letter, he would open up my, open up my envelope and he'd write on the, on the return envelope and on my letter, deceased, do not contact. And I've talked to other people in, in, that collect and they say, yeah, he's alive. I talked to one guy that lives right around the corner from him. He goes, he doesn't like to talk about it. So when I finally did get to sit down and talk to some of these players, um, you realize that it's such an ugly part of their past for some of them that they don't want to share, they don't want the memories to come back. And in fact, um, I don't know if you guys, do you guys know who Ike Walker is? Ike Walker is, uh, he was the catcher for the Satchel Page All-Stars in 1963. He lives here in Rochester, he lives in Ironicoy, right in the town we're in right now. And uh, while I was writing all these letters, my best friend had sent a letter to the DNC and they sent a photographer and a and uh, Jim Mamet, the reporter, out to my house to interview me and my daughter about what we were doing. And um, after the article came out, he got, a, he got an email from Ike Walker. And I had, I had researched Ike Walker, but nothing I could find online, the bios that I found online. It just talked that he played, he went up to Canada. A lot of these players, that's what they did. When Jackie went to the, the majors, a lot of the players ended up, up in Canada playing baseball. <coughs> Ike Walker ended up in Arundacoy. And I, went to, I graduated from West Veronica High School, and I went to high school with both of his sons. In fact, I was sandwiched in the middle of them. Uh, Dennis was uh, the class of 86. I was a class of 87. 
and David was a class of 88, and David Walker was the, uh, the running back from Syracuse. So he reached out to Jim Memmott and said, give, uh, give Jeff Klein my number, I want him to call me. So I called him, and he invited me and my daughter to his house, and we walked in. And I remember the day we walked in, he was very stoic. He sat at his kitchen table, crossed his, you know, stood, sat straight up, crossed his hands like this, and uh, he really wasn't talking much about, about baseball. So my icebreaker was the fact that I went to school with his son, so I mentioned that to him and I said, hey, well, I don't know if you were aware, you read the article that says I'm an Iranicoid native, I, go to, I, grad, I think I graduated with your sons. I mean, I knew I did, but I told him, I think I graduated with your sons. He goes, oh yeah? I go, yeah, David and Dennis? He goes, yeah, and then as soon as he realized that I graduated with his sons and I was friends with David in high school, he kicked back, his feet went up, his hands were behind his head like this, and then he opened up. And he, had, he ended up admitting to me that it was something that he had never talked about. He didn't want to share the stories because he dealt with all of the same stuff that we heard Jackie Robinson dealt with, but he dealt with it as, as recently as 1963. Now, obviously, we know that civil rights, the race relation problems are, are still apparent today, but he, these guys wanted to play baseball. They did it in the, in the face of adversity, and the people that we've corresponded with the stories they've shared with us are pretty much identical to what we know about Jackie Robinson, except it didn't happen in 1947. It was happening in the 50s and in the early 60s. These guys were still dealing with it. Um, one guy shared a story with me about a week-long tryout they had for black players. They were trying to they were trying to get some white uh, some black players to come to a white minor league team. With the uh, the ultimate goal was to get them to a major league team. And they had 50 players show up for this tryout. And at the end of the week, they had sent 45 of the players home. And at the end of the week, five guys left. They sat them all down, and they said, we've got good news, we've got bad news. The good news is you guys can all play major league caliber baseball. The bad news is we're not allowed to field any more blacks because we already met our quota. And that was the first time that someone had mentioned a quota to me. Now, MLB doesn't want to talk about quotas. The Red Sox certainly don't want to talk about what happened with them. They were the last team to field a black player in 1959 when they signed Punsy Green. They were happy to go into the 1960s being Lily White. And the only reason they, they did sign someone was because the NAACP filed a lawsuit against them. So then I started pressing these guys for, for more information about quotas and, you know, do you really think you had a good chance of um, making the major leagues? And then I started hearing story after story after story. Another player told me he did get signed to a white, uh, white minor league team down in Florida. And after a game, he and another player, and the reason I tell this story is because this other player's name is Jim Proctor. And I don't know if you know Jim Proctor did make the major leagues. They played a game. They were the only two black players on the team. And after the game, Jim Crow was still in full effect down in Florida. This is the late 50s. They slammed on the, the coach slammed on the brakes of the car, pulled over to the side of the road and said, get the hell out of the car. And they, they laughed and they're like, what do you mean get out of the car? He goes, get out of the car. So they go, okay, we'll play your game. So they got out of the car. They stood on the side, he goes, grab your bags. And they're like, okay, we'll grab our bags. So they grabbed their bags and he peeled off, took off. And before he did, he said, I'm tired of trying to find a restaurant for you guys. I'm not doing it anymore. And he drove away. So they sat on the side of the road and waited, and he never came back. So the two of them got on a bus, and they went to Indianapolis, and they tried out for the Indianapolis Clowns, and they both made the team. And then three years later, Jim Proctor made the major leagues. So I use that story to show that, and that's one of many, that it wasn't necessarily their talent that kept them from playing on a white team. Obviously, it was their skin color that kept them from playing. So we, we started hearing all these stories. And I started putting, throwing everything in here. I've got other stuff at home. This is a tiny bit of what we received. This is some of the stuff that we're, we're you know, more proud of. Um, so I told my, my wife and my daughter, I said, we have to share these stories with other people. So what we decided to do was uh, hold an event in Rochester. So we did. We created, uh, it's called They Stepped Up to the Plate. And our first event was in 2015, and we invited four former Negro League players to come to Rochester to give talks. And we did all of the fundraising. We started a GoFundMe page, and 
once I get going on Facebook, I'm passionate about it. And if you're a Facebook friend of mine, you will get tired of hearing about it because I will be on there every day talking about these guys and the fact that they need to be honored, they need to be honored now. I equate them to like, like World War II vets. I'm a veteran myself, so I can appreciate sacrifices people have made. World War II vets, there's a finite number of them left, and I'm glad that something is being done to honor them while we can. Nothing is really being done to honor these guys, and I've talked to enough of them to know Major League Baseball teams will bring them in, they'll sit them down at an autograph table, They'll sign some autographs before the game. They'll shuttle them out to the to the mound to throw out the first pitch. Then they're done. They go back to the table, sign some more autographs, and then they're done. Um, one guy told me that a team brought him in and did that. They never even paid him for it. They sent him on his way, and he never got a check. And this is five years ago, so they're still dealing with, um, you know, inequity. So we wanted to set up a, a forum for them to share their stories. I talked to enough of them, and they said we want to be able to talk to the youth. So we held the event. We were able to raise, we raised about $6,000 on GoFundMe in about three weeks. And this is just from community support. This is people reaching out, donating money, and because we pay for everything. We pay for their airfare, their hotel, their meals, their stipend, and we bring them in for three or four days. So the first one we had, we had Mike Walker, Dennis Biddle, Bill McCreary, and Ray Knox. Dennis Biddle and Ray Knox played on the Chicago American Giants. Bill McCreary played for the Kansas City Monarchs, and then Mike Walker was the catcher for Satchel Page All-Stars. So they came in, they gave their talk, and then we decided we're gonna make this a biennial event. We did it uh, again last summer, was our second one. We brought in three new players. One player uh, couldn't make it. Robert Scott played for the New York Black Yankees, interestingly. Um, they spent their last season here in Rochester, and I'm sure you could share more about that at a talk, but. Um, so we really wanted to have Robert Scott. He's one of the few that actually has a, a real baseball card made up by the Topps Chewing, Comf uh, chewing uh, Card Company, whatever you call it now. He actually has a baseball card, an Allen and Ginter Series baseball card. And uh, three days before our event, he unfortunately had to cancel because he had a heart condition. He had to go to the hospital. Um, but after that, I called him after our event. He wanted to know how it went. And I told him, and he said, why don't you come down to Atlanta? And um, we're, the Atlanta Braves are recognizing 16 former Negro Leaguers at a, at a Negro League tribute night. And I said, you know what, we had a plaque. We had a plaque made up for them. We had uh, one, of the, one of the things, outside of letting them talk and you know, paying them for their time, uh, we get them congressional recognition. Um, unfortunately, Louise Slaughter was our, was our contact. Louise, printed up uh, congressional awards for each of the players that attended our event. And um, Mayor, or, uh, Mayor Lovely Warren uh, gives them a uh, proclamation, city proclamation. They get a uh, Senate proclamation, and we created an award called the Jim Zapp Courage Award. Jim Zapp is the statue you see down there. He played with Willie Mays and on the uh, Birmingham Black Barons. And he was an outfielder with Willie Mays, and we had reached out to Jim early on, and he was gracious enough to sign a few autographs for us. And then I get a, I get a call from his son, James Zapp, and he said, my dad's in end-stage Alzheimer's. He can't sign autographs anymore. So I, Michaela was getting ready to write a letter to Jim Zapp, and I told her, I said, honey, unfortunately, that baseball card you have, you're not going to be able to get it signed. But the family is requesting if anybody has any um, blank cards to send to donate to the family. So I went online and I bought like eight more cards and I put them in an envelope with Michaela's card and, and I sent it to the family. I said, you guys have our condolences. It's sad, but that's where this is right now. These guys are all in their late 80s, early 90s. And uh, we, we get back a package and it has that, that statue in it signed by Jim Zapp. It has five more signed baseball cards. And James, I talked to him on the phone and he said before his dad went into end stage Alzheimer's, he had, he had him sign 200 baseball cards. And he sent us the letter that you see on the table, and he sent my daughter a, a baseball signed by Willie Mays. So I, that was that was really cool. I don't I didn't have at the time I didn't have a Willie Mays signed baseball, but my daughter got one before I did. So uh, James and I have become friends over the last few years, and I reached out to him, and I wanted to uh, I wanted to create an award from they stepped up to the plate to give to these players when they come in for their for their talk. So I. I asked James if we could uh, name the award after his dad. 
and he said, he, you know, he said, let me think about it. And I talked, he talked to his sister, he called me back, and he said the family would be honored for you guys to do that. So we did. We created this award, and it's called the Jim Zapp Courage Award. And, and that's one of the things we present, too, because we think Jim Zapp epitomizes what these guys did in the face of adversity and what they continue to do today. Jim Zapp was in end-stage Alzheimer's, and then James went into the hospital one day, and for the last three months of his life, he didn't know who he was, he didn't know who the nurses were, he couldn't remember his family's names, and he didn't even remember playing baseball professionally. And James and the family decided to take him off all of the medications except for the bare minimum that he needs to sustain life until he passes. James walks into the hospital one day and here comes Jim, wheeling down, the, he hadn't been mobile in four months, wheeling down the hallway. And James walks up and he stops in the hallway and Jim bumps into him and he looks up and he goes, James, where have you been? And he told me that his dad rebounded, he lived for six more months after that. And, uh, but it was with no meds, he, so he died with some dignity. He passed away knowing who everybody was. He remembered playing baseball. James shared our story with him and he said it was the first time he had seen his dad smile in over a year, knowing that there's people out there that are, that are advocating for these players that are still alive. Um, I don't know what else I want to share. We, uh, oh, Atlanta. We, um, so we got, we got the Atlanta Braves invited me and my family down to Atlanta last year. It was a total surprise for us, but um, we had wanted to give the awards to, um, to Robert Scott. So we went down there and I got to present in front of 16 former neighbor leaguers and all of their family members. And as nervous as I am right now talking in front of you guys, multiply that by 100. I sat in front of this crowd. It was, it was neighbor leaguers, their families, uh, neighbor league historians and researchers, and Atlanta Braves staff. There were about 150 people in this room. And I was one of the only white guys. It was 95 degrees out, and I'm wearing a suit and a Kansas City Monarchs hat, and I am sweating bullets. And afterwards, I was able to uh, present the awards to Robert Scott. We got to eat dinner with Robert and his family. And uh, I had people coming up to us. We ended up getting invited to the game that night, and they put us in a suite with these, with these players. And my daughter, I wish she could have been here today, but she walked around and she basically orally interviewed all of these, all of these players and came back to me. She goes, Daddy, that guy, he's a good speaker. Can we have him come to our next event? That guy over there, he's really funny. Can we have him come to our, and she, she was like vetting these guys. She's, you know, she's 12 years old now, but, so she was 11 at the time and she's going around and she did. She made her way around the room and ended up talking to 16 former Negro leaders. The representative from Atlanta, and this is how they get 16, uh, 16 players that come to their event. They reached out to me and, and asked me about they stepped up to the plate and I told them, you know, what we did and uh, who we've honored. And she goes, where do you find your players? I go, Chicago, um, Florida, Arkansas, wherever we can. She goes, how do you get them in? And I explained it to her. And she goes, oh yeah, we're lucky because I don't know if you're aware, Birmingham Black Barons were one of the last teams to fold. And when they folded, a lot of the players just settled in the Birmingham area. So. She says, we send a bus to Birmingham and we can put, she goes, we've got like 25 of them there that all played. And she goes, we can get any number of them to come to the events. So that's what they did. And so I talked to her and she goes, what would you think about they stepped up to the plate partnering with the Atlanta Braves? <laughs> I started laughing. I thought it was, I go, are you serious? She goes, yeah. I go, in my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, they stepped up to the plate slash MLB connection. Mm -hmm. So we did, we went down and it, it was amazing. We've got a lot of new contacts. There were players that I had been researching that I just I couldn't find. A lot of these guys are in and out of nursing homes, in and out of apartments, and they're really difficult to get in touch with. Um, so we did, and then the icing on the cake was when we got home, uh, this was in the mail. I'll pass this around if you guys want to take a look at this, but I was aware of the Jerry Malloy um, Negro League Conference, and we actually got invited to it, but it was, it was the same time we were on vacation. And we come home, and Ted Knorr is one of the one of these Ted Knorr, Larry Lester, and Leslie Heafy kind of head up this conference. And I got a, an email from Ted Knorr, and he wanted my my uh, home address. So I told him, "Yeah, like they're going to send us stuff from the conference. That's pretty cool." But we get home, and, and this is what it was. It was the Robert Peterson Recognition Award. And I don't know if you're aware, Robert Peterson was the author who wrote the uh, the book "Only the Ball Was White." 
and it's it's considered the Bible for Negro League research and um, and history. And they awarded my daughter and I that, and that was like that was the icing on the cake for us last year. But uh, that's where we are now. We are uh, planning on doing another event next year. I've got at least 10, 10 or 11 more players that want to come in, and unfortunately, due to time constraints and the money, uh, we can only get you know we can only do like four or five at a time because these guys can talk. When Dennis Biddle got up there, and he was his talk was like 45 minutes alone, but. Uh, we plan on doing more. Uh, if you guys want to take a look at this, I'll pass this stuff around. There's no real organization to this other than um, I think it's in the order that I got it in the mail. That's most of what we've received. We've we've gone and visited a couple players to do interviews, and that's where this is going. Um, I'm, I'm writing a book, and it's going to be called "They Stepped Up to the Plate." I'm documenting. I'm still researching players, trying to find more players, but I'm doing interviews of the players that are willing to. I've already done four or five interviews. They range from eight to 15 minutes long. We're gonna to try to document as much of their, as many other stories as we can while we can to honor them while we still have time. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff, for bringing all this great stuff. Um, after the next talk, we'll have about a 10-minute break, so feel free to pump and look at stuff, ask questions and whatnot. Um, speaking of the uh, Jerry Malloy Conference, um, we do have a bid in to host that, so we're hoping to bring the Jerry Malloy Conference to Rochester sometime in the next it's, few years, hopefully. I'm, it, from what I'm hearing, you, we are like one of two, and it's they're leaning towards Rochester. Yeah, so I certainly so hope so. I talk to Ted Norno about once a month, and he wants to do it in Rochester. Excellent. Yeah. Right, and I... Can yeah. I ask you to take a minute, a minute and a half, to tell them about Cooperstown last summer after they oh. stepped up to the plate? Sure. I think that's a wonderful story. Well, the first they stepped up to the plate, um, Bill McCrary came in, and some of these guys have to fly with family members. And uh, Bill comes in with his son Tracy, and Tracy's a fisherman. Tracy is 65 years old, I think, 66, somewhere in there. And how's that? <laughs> That's about gas. It's, how do you do this stuff? This is awesome. I stole some pictures off your Facebook oh, page. Oh, perfect. <laughs> he vetted me and I didn't even know it. Um, so Tracy wanted to go fishing. It just didn't work out. They were here for three days. So the second time around, we, uh, we had Jake Sanders and Ernest Van come in and we picked them up from the airport. And we picked everybody up. We had everybody in the van. And we go to the, we go to the hotel to drop them off. And we only drop off Jake and Ernest. And they look at Bill and they go, where are you guys going? And Tracy goes, we're sleeping at Jeff's house. <laughs> so I hear them yelling as we're pulling out. Of, or they weren't yelling, but I, I, they, I had to explain it to them. Um, I wanted to take Tracy fishing. So they agreed. His dad needed to get out of the house. He was 87 years old at the time. His dad wanted to get out of the house anyway. So they agreed. They came and we hosted them at our house. And they were at our house for seven days. And while we were there, one of the things I wanted to do was take him to see Buck O'Neill's statue because Buck O'Neill was Bill's manager when he played for the Monarchs. Now, Bill knew, Bill had been to Cooperstown before, but he'd never seen the Buck O'Neill statue because it wasn't there when he was there last. So he had no idea. And I told my wife, I go, we cannot put an 87-year-old in a car to drive all the way to Cooperstown and then come back the same day. So we rented some, a couple hotel rooms and we took Bill to see Buck O'Neill's statue, and it was amazing when we walked in there. It was probably the most emotional that I've gotten in, in dealing with these guys. First, it starts with uh, my buddy runs ahead to go to Cooperstown to let them know that you have a former Negro leader coming into the Hall of Fame right now. And the guy's like, he's, my buddy told me, totally blew him off. He's like, yeah, okay, we, we're, we have a Negro leader coming in. And as soon as Bill, Bill was using a cane, he doesn't have it in the picture, but as soon as he came up the steps and he sees the, the Kansas City Monarch hats, Kansas City Monarchs hat, he looks at him and he goes, oh my God, we have an ear leader coming into the well. So he grabs these guys and as good as they can do it, they kind of rolled out the red carpet. And I had contacted the Hall of Fame before and I, I left like three messages. I never heard back from anybody. So I'm like, we're just gonna wing it. I just want him to see the statue. So they brought him in and Everybody, they shook his hand, and he signed a couple autographs. I wanted him to see the statue. As we're walking away, 
my buddy overheard the the guy that's their top security guy. He's been there for like 25 years, and he knew Cool Papa Bell, and he had met all these guys when they came in there. He turned to his staff and he says, "This cannot happen again." He goes, "We cannot have someone like this walk into the Hall of Fame, and we don't do something to recognize it." So that single-handedly, that trip could have single-handedly changed the way the Hall of Fame conducts business in terms of Negro leaders coming in. Um, they acknowledged that they got the messages, but just didn't do anything with it. So we took them to the statue, and there's, a, there's an exhibit, and there's some words on the, on the wall, and I was able to, Bill sat there, and I was able to read it. He was crying, I was crying. People around us that didn't even know what was going on, they were coming to see the statue, but as soon as they, they saw me reading it to Bill, and they saw Bill crying, they realized that they were witnessing something. They didn't know what it was until afterwards. They asked who he was, and we said, well, he played on the Kansas City Monarchs for three years in the late 40s. And uh, so he signed some more autographs, he sat down, he composed himself, and we took him up to the Negro League exhibit. And I went in ahead of time, and this was my favorite part of the trip, I went in ahead of time, there were a bunch of kids in there, and these guys love talking to kids. So I walked in, and they were all looking at it, and the dads are explaining to the kids what everything was, and I go, do you guys want to meet someone who played with these guys? And same thing, I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> they turn around, I bring Bill in, and he carries his baseball cards with him, he always has them in his pocket, and they're already signed, so he started handing out the cards to the kids and everything. He was like a celebrity again. It was awesome. Um, so that was our trip to Cooperstown. That was one of the things I wanted to do when, when they came in. I wanted to get them to go see Buck's statue. That's all. Yeah. A couple of things. Um, I was a reporter in Topeka, at Topeka, Kansas, and I was once interviewing Lee Smith in the Royals uh, um, you know, dugout uh, or locker room. And, um, I'm talking to him and he said, you can ask, I asked him a question, he said, you can ask the guy who signed me. I said, well, who's that? And he goes, he's right behind you. And I turn around and it's Buck O'Neill. And he was kind of a goodwill ambassador at that point for the Kansas City Royals. Um, just a couple things. One, do you know the Baseball Heritage Museum in Cleveland? Mm -hmm. They do a lot of work on the Negro League. Do they? Yeah, and they would, I guarantee they would love it if you came out and spoke to them. And I can talk to you about that later if that interests okay. you. Thank you. They have a lot of, uh, a repository of a lot of uh, information also. Um, I'm going to be speaking later about Rocky Colavito, but I, I've talked to Rocky about the Negro Leagues because, um, because he played with Larry Doby, mm -hmm. right? The second major league, the first in the American League, three months after Jackie, he was with the Indians. He only played a little bit with, with Larry Doby, and it was later in Larry Doby's Indians career, actually his career as a whole. But he also played with Davey Popes, um, Al Smith, and you know, he told me what really upset him, what he was exposed to was in spring training, when, not with Cleveland, because they were in Tucson, uh, their spring training um, facility, but when he went to the Tigers, they, they were in um, Florida. And he said it made him sick to his stomach that he would, the, the, the black players couldn't get off the bus. They couldn't go into the restaurants. So you know, like, they have to go in the restaurant and bring them back food. And then they couldn't stay in the hotel with, with the white ball players until 63 when mm -hmm. the Tigers moved to a hotel where it was uh, desegregated. But, you know, he had very strong feelings about that. And the last point I'll just make on this issue was when Rocky was a coach with the Indians in the uh, mid-70s. And um, he was with Frank Robinson when Frank was starting his second year as, as manager of the Indians. And in spring training, he was sitting behind Frank, who occupied the first seat on the right where managers typically sat on the team buses. So Frank yelled out to the bus driver, all right, we're ready to go, let's, let's go. And the bus didn't move. And Frank said, all right, we're ready to go, let's go. And the bus didn't move. So Frank got up and he just let loose. Like what, you can't listen to a black man? I'm the manager of this club, I run this club, Sorry if you don't like that, we're moving, you know? And the guy, the guy took off. So, Where, that, was, city was that? that was in Florida, but I don't remember the city. I have to look Bill, it up. Bill shared uh, a similar story um, with the bus ride. They pulled in, the Monarchs pulled into a city uh, one day and the police met them at the city line and they wouldn't let them, they wouldn't let them come into the city. So they, uh, they had a, a cop on a motorcycle, you know how loud Harleys are, the motorcycle rode around the bus the entire night to inconvenience them and make it so they could, I mean, it was already uncomfortable trying to sleep on a bus, but now you're listening to the exhaust. They rode around the bus all night long, wouldn't let them pull into the city until the next morning, and then they did. They said they were all fatigued, and they still ended up winning the game. But uh, that's, and that's, 
not uncommon. You know, the experience of these guys are a lot of them had it. Right. Oh, that was our that was our first event. Yeah. That's Ike Walker uh, next to me, then Ray Knox, Bill McCurry, and Dennis Biddle. And that's Michaela, who you, you guys unfortunately didn't get to meet today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again, Jeff. Thank you very much.